Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darin Abu Gaida. As the UN Security Council debated a resolution to send 30 monitors into Syria to monitor Kofi Annan's ceasefire, the shelling and gunfire continues. On the second day of the UN-backed ceasefire to end the 13-month uprising, protests continued. Both sides are believed to have breached the terms, with several deaths being reported. The violence now makes the UN's next move more important than ever. But as Kofi Annan's spokesman points out, there is still a long way to go. The um, Department of Peacekeeping Operations is working around the clock to find the, 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 the necessary number of troops for the full observer mission eventually. At the moment, we have the advanced team standing by to board planes and to get, their, get themselves on the ground as soon as possible. We, we are under no illusion here that we have come to the end of this conflict. This is only the beginning of a long road towards uh, uh, reconciling and towards building uh, 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 the, the, the future that Syrians aspire to, where there are no detentions uh, without cause, where law enforcement guarantees peace and security in the streets, not the military. For more on this, I'm joined by our guests from Washington, D.C., Hossein Ibish, a contributor to magazines such as Foreign Policy and The Atlantic. Hossein also writes a weekly column for Now Lebanon. From London, Haytham al-Sabahi, who's a member of the Syrian Social Club. That's a group in London that advocates for reform in Syria and not regime change. And from Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, Hossein al-Harbi, a Syrian opposition activist and a university lecturer. Hossein also hosts a TV talk show on Syria, and that show is called al Shab. Welcome to you, all of you gentlemen to this edition of uh, Inside Syria. Hussein Abish in Washington, fragile, mm. uh, shaky, barely holding. Mm. These are the words that are being yeah. used to describe the ceasefire that's meant to be mm. taking place in Syria right now. So how important yeah. does this then make the UN observer mission? Uh, I t unimportant, I think, honestly, in the long run, uh, because those are all euphemisms. Euf euphemisms for failure. Um, the, the ceasefire is not, in fact, in effect. There uh, numerous reports of people being killed, of shelling, uh, and of other uh, acts of violence, and particularly on the part of the regime. All, the regime claims that some rebels have also been engaged in violence. That's possible. And the point is that the ceasefire is, is a farce, and the whole Anand mission is dead on arrival, was dead on arrival from the beginning. Not one of its uh, points have been implemented, not one. Uh, and uh, not even the ceasefire is, is going, I think, shaky and fragile and all. Those are just euphemisms. So the next phase, if, if the UN is able to send 30 unarmed observers to Syria, uh, it's not going to change anything. The regime has made it very clear that its point of view is that it is being attacked by terrorists who are Islamists and Salafist jihadists and Al-Qaeda inspired by the archfiend al-Zarqawi, uh, the late Iraqi uh, or uh, late Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, villain, uh, and that it is going to pursue a military solution, a military victory, and engage in its own reforms on its own timetable. They're not interested in dialogue. They're not interested in any of the six points of the Anand mission. And uh, they will treat all of this as a very useful diplomatic game that they will spin out as long as possible for their own purposes. But it's not, nothing's going to happen to change things in Syria until the balance of power on the ground changes. And that's going to change everyone's strategic calculations. Until until then, I think the regime will just pursue a military solution on the ground and play whatever diplomatic games it can uh, for uh, giving it space to do to pursue that military solution. All right. We are going to address certainly a lot of the points that you just raised, uh, Hussein. But uh, mm. Hussein uh, El Harbi, over to you first, because I'd just like to focus on the international response uh, to this particular resolution for a moment, because we know that Russia was uh, against it. It was put forward its own draft resolution for these UN observer observers to go into Syria. Do you think that this resolution could be watered down so much that it's actually meaningless? Well, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to uh, greet or salute the Syrians who went to the streets and said the word that they will not fear anymore al-Assad or al-Ba'ath party and they will not go back to their homes until they get the freedom. 
That's the first thing. Uh, regarding the six points Anand's uh, plan, it was a failure from the very beginning, ma'am, to the end. Because in what they call it the ceasefire, uh, more than 32 violations by the regime has been done. And also that's what Anand himself said. So, and so many people, if we say, okay, the regime, maybe some of the people will say the regime is accepting that ceasefire and is abiding by it. So who killed those people daily, the bloodshed in Syria daily? I think the 30 people, they plan, or the 30 supervisors, they plan to send them to Syria. Those people or those 30 people are not enough to control a, a hole for students making an exam, rather than to uh, stopping al-Assad from killing the Syrians for 14 months. So really we have to talk logic if we want to end that a tragedy of the Syrian people or the Syrian country. We have to talk logic. We have to speak logic. We have to protect the Syrians under the umbrella of uh, international community, not just condemning and talking. And I think all of the com world community are sharing in the Syrian bloodshed every day. Haytham, so I think, all right, Haytham, Al, Haytham yeah. Al Sabahi in London, what do you think? Do you think the UN Observer Mission has any chance of success in Syria? Well, good evening to you and to your viewers. Uh, of course they have. Uh, the Syrian people and the majority of Syrian, uh, they look, uh, I mean, they were positive, especially uh, on the Friday yesterday. And they're looking for uh, a peaceful and a solution to this crisis. Of course, the Syrian government has signed the, this plan, agreed to this plan, and of course, they have to negotiate some details. Uh, let's not be, I mean, in the situation when a uh, ceasefire announced, there's not going to uh, have any problems of any uh, ceasefire uh, broken here and there. The Syrian government agreed to a ceasefire. The Syrian government is one side, can order its troop, its security service, its police to ceasefire unless they've been attacked. On the other hand, there is the other side. The other side is not one group is not uh, there is the terrorist between them there's the Syrian free army who may be backing terrorists we don't know so they don't have one command and control uh, to, to for Mr. Kofi Annan or United Nations to agree with this so it's going to be uh, broken if they threaten any Syrian army any civilians any uh, what you call security or a police, of course, the, the Syrian government or the Syrian troops is going to return fire, is going to sort out these people. Because don't forget the plan is under Syrian sovereignty and Syrian authority. Hussein Ibish, I see you well, wanting exactly to get in there. That's exactly what I just... Yeah, okay. that, that was exactly a perfect summary of what I said the regime's position was. The opposition is a bunch of terrorists, and they have to be suppressed by military force. And, uh, and the, you know, the, this, this business of negotiations, uh, there's no one to talk to. And the whole thing is, is a, is, needs a military solution. We just had a perfect explication of that from uh, Haitham in London. So thank you very much for making my point for me. Clarify that for a second, Hussein. You're talking about a yes. military solution? You're talking about a well, military intervention? Yeah, no, no. I'm saying that what Haitham was saying it was exactly what the regime says, that the opposition is a bunch of terrorists and uh, they attack the government and they attack the people and do these horrible, nasty things. And, and whether there's a ceasefire or not, the government is compelled to deal with these terrorists. And uh, that, that is the nature of the problem. And that is essentially a military problem. And it, it therefore requires, as he just said, a military solution. If you, It didn't take any re reading between the lines. I mean, that's really what he said. Uh, and, and so that is the government's position. And what I'm saying is that <clears throat> the balance of power in Syria right now allows the government and its supporters to feel that they can actually deal with the insurgency that exists now in militarily with, it, with an opposition that is weak and politically divided and indeed militarily divided. Uh, and that um, it, this, all of this business of ceasefires and negotiations and diplomacy, it's a farce. It's a game the regime is playing to, to win space, to pursue a military victory over all the opposition, which it characterizes as a gang of terrorists, as he just did. Hi, Sam. Would you like to respond to that? 
Syria didn't appoint Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan is appointed by the Security Council, by United Nations. Uh, Syria do doesn't blame a terrorist or a group or a fighters, whatever your guest calling them. Syria is doing its part with Kofi Annan and respecting what they signed for. Kofi Annan, Mr. Kofi Annan and the United Nations and those countries who has a borders with Syria or they don't, who support this group, they have to deal with the, those group. Mr. Kofi Annan has to negotiate with all this group and bring the result to the Syrian government. I did not say we have to deal with this group. This mission is, Man. there is two sides to it. There is one you side, is the Syrian sides. side, and there is the other side, the, the, this, uh, what you call, I call them terrorists. I call them terrorists. When they're killing and maiming people and blowing buildings and a child soldier, according to United Nations, and, and, and raping and this, of course they are a terrorist. Show me one command center for this, these people. And if Mr. Anand uh, can control and talk to these people, well, good luck to him. That's what we are Syrian people we want. We want a, pers a peaceful and political solution to this crisis. Crisis. We do not want to fight, we don't want to blood, and we are not going, as a Syrians, as a people, leave the army to the side, we are not going to retaliate for this. We are, we believe our army, our police could do the job, and Mr. Kofi Annan or United Nations or other countries who involve themselves in this, they can deal with it from the other side. I'm glad you See, brought up the say, point about what again. Syrians okay. want. Uh, one second, uh, Hussein uh, Ibish in sure, Washington, just sure. one second, because yeah. uh, Haysam is talking yeah. about what Syrian people want. Let me put that to uh, Hussein Al Harbi, because Hussein, your show, your talk show is actually called Al Shab, the people. So, yeah. what do you think the Syrian people that you talk to want? when it comes to this UN observer mission. Do you think this UN observer, do they think rather this UN observer mission is able to help the, the end the cycle of violence? Or are they happy with the positions that countries such as Russia and China are taking when they veto UN Security Council uh, resolutions against Syria? Okay, first of all, let me just uh, to, uh, I want to salute Mr. Haytham. Uh, he is a, a good student of Bashar al-Assad. He memorized his, his lesson very well. He said that uh, as if there are two parties or two armies confronting each other, the, the, the people or the Syrian people and the regime. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing, Ahmad Daoud Oglu himself said when I was a, a consultant, uh, of the president of the Turkey, uh, Turkish president, he said, I agreed with Al Assad, Bashar Al Assad, 62 times. That was not a political agreement, it was uh, economic agreements. None of them has been uh, fulfilled or done at all. So, this guy is a big liar. How you expect him? First of all, if you want to show really a good intention, just pull out all the military troops from the streets, from the city, and let the people demonstrate freely to express their views according to the Syrian law. That's the time you can decide if the majority of the major or, or most of the people of the Syrian people say you want Assad or you don't want Assad. Assad, if you want him, let the people express their opinion freely, then that's the time you will see how many people will stay in their homes, how many, uh, even, uh, let's say, the students, <laughs> the workers, and, and the mothers. So. Just pull out the troops and you will see Assad will fall the next day. They will creep to, the, uh, to, to his house and they will crack him down and they will t t tell him to go out to Iran. You know, Al-Assad last 10 days, he launched a campaign called just to reserve or to protect the Syrian eagle. That eagle, you know, the eagle got uh, wings to fly and everything is fine for him. Now Al-Assad is free just to protect the Syrian, eagle, uh, the Syrian eagle. I wrote an essay, it's ridiculous. If you want to protect that animal, please save the Syrian lives and the blood. Don't follow them All to right. Turkey to shoot them inside the Turkish borders and to Lebanon. Okay. I think if he wants to say the majority and the people want Assad or doesn't want, just pull out every military troops from the street and the thanks how we can also for no the chance. dialogue just give me one second 30 seconds to come to the dialogue how you want the Syrians after 14 months of calling to to come to the dialogue if you 
put the gun or the pistol on the table and you put the troops or the tank outside on the on the on the on the door and outside of the city you put the cannon you tell me come to a dialogue what kind of a dialogue this one right. this is a bloody really killing of the Syrians every day by Bashar al-Assad right and if right Bashar Hussein, al -Assad is serious with that okay. he must say a, a, a free elections you know a free elections for three months, then he will, okay, this is a free election. I will not stay in, in power if the people say go out, go to hell. All right, right, Hussein. But at the same time, there are reports of the opposition as well and the Free Syrian Army now being armed in Syria. But Hussein Ibish, over to you, because yes. regardless of what's going yeah. on internationally uh, with Russia mm -hmm. and China, there is a lot of calls, yeah. there are a lot of calls, uh, like uh, Hussein mm -hmm. al-Harbi was just saying, for Bashar al-Assad yeah. to simply go away and step down. But what is the alternative yeah, yes. here? What is the alternative? I mean, if you look at the opposition, it's accused of being mm -hmm. uh, not united. That's to say the least, it, in fact. So what is the I alternative? Think that's true, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that, I, I know, I mean, I think that the cr criti criticisms of the opposition, both politically in terms of political divisions within the SNC and between the SNC and other groups, uh, are, are fair. Uh, and right, I, and to I what also extent the then, Hussein, to what extent is that, in well, fact, the mili is that preventing well. a peaceful resolution? It, well, it's not exactly preventing a peaceful resolution in the sense that the, the go well, in a way it is. It, 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 it has made it more difficult for external powers to consider uh, majorly backing them. I mean, I think they're not as attractive uh, an alternative, either militarily or politically, as the uh, NTC in Libya had been. However, uh, I think that I in spite of the uh, flaws in the opposition, uh, I think the international community is realizing that it's, it's slowly coming to the conclusion that uh, it's actually the regime which is driving the conflict and that wants to present Syrians with a binary choice of either accepting them on their own terms or allowing the country to slowly get dragged into a deeper and deeper civil conflict. And it may be that they don't face a united opposition, which makes it all the more dangerous. But I, I really do think there's no hope of changing the calculus of the regime until the balance of power in that country is changed. Sending in UN observers is not going to work. They're not going to fulfill any six-point plan or any ceasefire or anything like that. Hussein, you keep they talking look about at this changing opposition the balance and, of power. And, and, you keep talking about yes, changing the balance of power. Just clarify that. I do. Clarify that. It can be it can be done in many ways. Uh, it can be done by Turkey creating a buffer zone in inside of uh, uh, on, on the border, which I think the Turks are increasingly interested in doing, and the Americans, for their domestic political reasons, I think are kind of holding them back from that. I don't know that they would have done it yet, but they're getting very close. I but think. But are to the, the Turks point where really eager to get it. themselves into that, something that might yeah, affect them? I don't think. I don't think they're eager to do it, but I think you have to realize that, that, that the number of refugees has gone up by one third in the past few weeks. I mean, this is, this is a, they cannot allow this, this situation to continue to fester on their border, particularly in Kurdish inhabited regions. And I, I think it's coming to the point where they feel they have no choice. That's one thing. Another thing would be for responsible members of the international community to identify elements within the opposition that they, that they think are, are useful and, and are uh, worthy of support and begin supporting them much more robustly politically, diplomatically, and maybe even militarily as well. Something has to happen to change the calculation of people close to the center of power in Syria, because right now they see no reason to do anything other than crack down and use violence and then play these diplomatic games in the UN. And that is, that is just going to continue until the situation on the ground changes. It will eventually change on its own. I think the, the situation, even if the international community does nothing, eventually it will, it will change internally. But uh, right now, there is a huge opportunity for outside powers, uh, both the uh, benevolent and malevolent powers, or wh whoever they are, uh, to have a, a profound strategic impact on the nature and identity of the opposition and what comes next in Syria by getting involved, in, in not in seeking some kind of negotiation which right now cannot exist, but by empowering those groups in the opposition, those elements of the opposition, that they think will produce 
a better outcome in Syria. If not, they're leaving it for others to do it, and I'm sure others will be do, do, are doing it now and will increasingly do it uh, in the coming months. All right, well, just listen to these comments uh, by U.S. Senators John McCain and Joseph Lieberman, who visited a refugee camp in Turkey earlier this week, and while they complimented Anand's uh, ceasefire and peace plan, they said that further help was needed for the Syrian opposition to change the military balance of power on the ground. Hussein, that's in fact what you're talking about. And then the senators went on to say that uh, that would mean a concerted international effort to provide these brave fighters in Syria with the capabilities to defend themselves. It means helping them establish safe havens in Syria from which they can better train and organize themselves, ideally with the help of foreign partners. And it means regional and international military efforts to help defend these safe havens and the people in them, including with foreign air power. Hossein al-Harbi, do you advocate what the senators are saying? Do you believe and do you want uh, foreign military intervention in Syria? Actually, let's talk as, as I, uh, that's a sticky point. Uh, most of the people uh, saying Syria has got, uh, a, a, uh, let's say, a sensitive uh, situation and it's a different situation. What's the difference about Syria for after 14 months of killing? Yes, if we don't, at least the minimum thing, if they don't want to military interfere in Syria to stop the daily killing of the Syrians, at least, they, at least they have to protect them, you know. And really, that's the, the minimum thing I think the world community to, to keep the face, if they want the, the, the international world community, if they want to keep the face uh, and to just to give some, uh, something to the Syrians after 14 months of the killing, they can do that thing for them, as Senator John McCain said. And I think if, we have, if they have uh, done that from the beginning, so thousands of the, the, the Syrians will not be killed and th thousands of the houses will not, uh, houses will not be destroyed. But you asked the, the question, Hussein. The you asked the question, Sorry? why is Syria different from the other countries? But... Uh, the yeah, argument that's put forward, the argument, actually, let, let me just tell you what the argument that's put forward is, and you can respond to that, is that mm. Syria is a mix of uh, religions. It has uh, the Kurds, the Alawites, the Druze, the Christians. Yeah. What happens to all these groups? Can, can I ask, uh, answer your question, ma'am? Uh, Syria, 7,000 years or uh, uh, 9,000 years before that, it's a mix, you know. And they never, uh, they, uh, before Assad and Assad family, they were living together in a peace. And also in 1929, the first elected prime minister, Faris al Khouri, he was a Christian from Hasbiya, Liban, what, what we call Lebanon uh, this time. It was all Syria. So he was the prime minister. And he was Al Awqaf minister. You know what does it mean, Al Awqaf? He was the minister for the Muslims. For the Muslim religion only. Now, Al Awqaf, Muslim, Al -Awqaf minister, he should put a, a, a mama like that, as big as this one, uh, that one in his head, like Ahmed Hassoun. But at that time, when, when it was Syria was a democrat, a democratic country, and a, a country for f freedom to speak out your opinion as a, a citizen, not under the gun to say okay yes to uh, Bashar al-Assad or yes to Hafez al-Assad. At that time, the first election, 1929, mm -hmm. Faris al khouri was the first prime minister to be elected, and he was a Christian, and also Saleh al Ali, mm. Sheikh Saleh al Ali, he is the one who led the uh, Syrian revolution to liberate Syria from the French. Right. You know? So Syria is not a matter, let's say, of uh, minorities or what, what they call right. what they call it. So, well, so Syria, all of us. Uh, Hussein, are Hussein, your answer to that. Oh, no. Hussein, your answer. Because uh, yeah, Hussein mean, honest, Harbi is saying it's yeah. not an issue of minorities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is, to be honest with you. I mean, sadly enough, he, he, I think there's elements of, of, of truth in what he's saying, that it, it's certainly much worse. I mean, sectarian and ethnic differences are much worse, given uh, 30 years of the rule of the Ba'athists and al-Assad. Uh, there's no question about that, but there is a problem here. Uh, and I do think the, the opposition, uh, both on the ground and in exile, both political and military, has not done enough. Uh, to reach out to uh, Kurdish uh, concerns about regional autonomy and federalism, or to uh, address in very specific ironclad guarantees to sectarian uh, communities such as Alawites and Christians and others about their concerns which are legitimate and they're rational. They're not irrational. It's not crazy for these groups to have concerns about the post-Assad future. Uh, that's rational and reasonable and I think one of the problems 
with the opposition is that they have not done enough uh, to reassure those groups and, and with the Kurds to draw them into the opposition and with uh, Alawites, Christians and others to reassure them that uh, there's, uh, there's to be no reprisals, there's to be no persecution, there's, there's to be equality and, and just to put the past behind and, and that saying that it's something that will be dealt with in a very vague way fairly or justly or everyone will be equal or saying it will be dealt with after the fall of the regime is not enough. And, and so right. I, I think that there's work, work to be done here on the opposition side. It's a fair critique of the opposition that they haven't done enough. All right, so score. we'll have to leave it there, gentlemen. But thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside uh, Syria. Hussein Ibish uh, from Washington and Hussein Al Harbi from Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And thanks to Haysam Al Sabahi, who joined us from London a little earlier on. And to our viewers, we thank you for watching. You can always catch the show again online by going to our website. Our website is aljazeera.com. For me and the whole Inside Syria team, goodbye for now.